The O Cannabis Conference and Expo returns to Toronto, June 1st through the 3rd. This exciting event is free for cannabis retailers and will feature Tommy Chong receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award at the O Cannabis Industry Awards. There are still good booth locations available. For more information about exhibiting or to register to attend, go to ocannabis.com. That's O C A N N A B I Z dot com. I mean, I just could not be more proud of what we do every day and proud to tell people about what I do. I am a proud dispensary owner, a proud cannabis user, and I am proud to see all of the young people blowing the doors off of what this industry and this business means. everybody, and welcome to the first episode of the Proud to Work in Cannabis podcast. I'm your host, Carson Humiston, and I am so thrilled to have our first guest ever, Wanda James, on the show with us today. Wanda, welcome to the show. Oh my gosh, I'm thrilled to be on this show with you, Ms. Carson, so this is going to be a lot of fun. So everybody, before we kick off this show, Wanda and I have just an amazing story to share when I was first getting started in the industry, 2015, 2016. Wanda, of course, was a, a legend, an icon in the industry. And so I kept running into her at at networking events. And Wanda, maybe you can remind all of us w- what happened several times. So, okay, I don't know what happened several times. I know what happened on the very last time. We did. We ran into each other quite a few times. And as at these events, there's so many people. And we had a smaller event with a number of girlfriends that we'd all gotten together for, I think it was a brunch at, oh, I can't remember whose house it was at. But you and I were having a great conversation in the kitchen, getting food. And you were telling me about this amazing new business that you had been working in and had started. And and I looked at you and I was like, you know what? I'm just, I'm really just happy to meet you and, and so glad that you're doing this. And Carson looked me dead in the face, completely stone faced, straight faced. And she says, I've met you like five times. <laughs> yeah. And every time I said, you know what? The next time I'm going to tell her we've met, come on, please remember me. So now Wanda and I have a running joke of every time we run into each other, I say, great to meet you, Wanda. I'm Carson. And I say, what was your name again? Yeah, exactly. What was your name again? But seriously, I'm so thrilled to have you here today. So to, to kick off for our listeners, please just give us an intro of yourself, how you decided to break into the industry and, and a little bit about your background and, and how you got to where you are today. Well, that's a lot. I was born a poor black child. (laughs) No. So cannabis has always been a part of my life. And I had met my brother in 1999, long story, but anyway, just had met my brother. And the first thing that came out of his mouth was, since I just got out of prison. And I was like, oh my God. So I thought that just getting out of prison would have meant that you hurt somebody, you did something horrible, you robbed a bank, you did something bad. And when he told me that he was in prison for four ounces of bad Texas street weed, which is about $160 worth on the street, uh, my brother lost 10 years of his life. And four of those years, he told me that he picked cotton in a maximum security prison in Texas. So his crime for $160 was for a black kid to pick cotton in Texas. And that's demoralizing, dehumanizing, and disgusting. So when I heard that story, I dove into what was happening in cannabis of the targeting of black and brown, mostly boys between the ages of 17 and 24. 85% of arrest in the United States was that particular group because America has always had a slave labor class. So when we knew that, my husband and I had just come off of Barack Obama's National Finance Committee in 2009. And I was Congressman Jared Polis's campaign manager, now Governor Jared Polis. And we decided to open up a dispensary because we wanted to talk about the harms of the drug war, the harms that had happened to the black and brown communities. And we knew that no matter how this industry was going to develop, that they couldn't make criminals out of me and my husband. So we opened up our first dispensary in mid-2009, and we have been in cannabis now for 13 years with all the ups and downs, and, and we still haven't seen equity and equality the way that we want to, but what we're proud of is that in the states that it's legal, we have pretty much stopped the arrest of all people. Here in Colorado, we've decreased it by 97% um, of arrest of cannabis in the state. 
just the impact that you have made in the space. Can you tell us about just the process of opening the first dispensary? I think that many people listening to this podcast got into the industry a couple years ago. And when I listen to you telling the stories from 13 years ago, give us a taste of what cannabis in Colorado for you, one of the first women in the industry period was like. So the crazy thing is now cannabis is about money, right? Money, 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 money. You're not opening a dispensary unless you have millions in the bank. You're not buying a dispensary unless you have more millions in the bank. But back in the day, it probably cost us about $200,000 to open up our first dispensary because at the time there was no licensing. There was no procedures. They told you to make it up. So we opened as a wellness center. And so you had to have first month, last month and security deposit for a rental unit. And then the only other cost that you had was how are you going to decorate your dispensary? People would show up with bags of weed. You could test it out there in the dispensary or edibles you could taste. And there was no testing for anything that had to be done, no regulation. But it wasn't about money 13 years ago. It was about your freedom, right? So there was real possibility that you would be arrested and go to jail. And it was happening. People that opened up legitimate dispensaries were arrested. And some of those folks actually got prison sentences behind it, even in the legal state of Colorado. So that was the real fear then was going to jail. We were actually raided as well, too. We had a situation where the Adams County Sheriff's Department broke into and and raided our our grow facility and they were sitting there ready to arrest us. So yeah, it, it was really about losing your freedom 13 years ago, not about making money. Which is Im- Again, people listening to the podcast considering working in or opening a dispensary, right? The idea of going to prison for opening a business or getting a job is just not something that's on their radar. And so it's because of the pioneers like Wanda that everybody that's listening to this podcast today is listening to this podcast today. Wanda, talk to us a little bit about over time how your business has managed to compete with all of the new capital that continues to flood in. And you guys have remained a leader and one of the most well-known dispensaries in Colorado. Talk to us about how that has changed over the years. I mean, there's a number of reasons why I think we've done well. One, we've been in the space for 13 years, being the first African-Americans legally licensed in America to own a dispensary, that marketing has absolutely helped. But I believe firmly that we're well known because we did everything that people didn't do back in the day. We didn't keep our heads down and stay quiet, right? We were screaming from the rooftops that this plant should be decriminalized, that there are health benefits to this plant, that there are medical benefits to this plant, that there are better recreational choices by using this plant than using other substances that, you know, alcohol, (laughs) prescription drugs, whatever it may be that, that people were using at the time. So, we were so vocal. We still are. We're just vocal about it. And we even call ourselves the most political dispensary in America because we don't shy away from politics. We call out politicians that stand against cannabis, that stand against equality, that stand against decriminalization. So we're not afraid to do all of the things they tell you not to do in business, right? And I like to liken us to Ben and Jerry's. We take those chances. Do some people get pissed off and decide to boycott us? Yeah, but we're even proud of the people who boycott us, because that's even a sense of pride, not just who stands with you, but who stands against you. I think it's just because we've been bold in the face of cannabis, and we'll continue to do that. And I believe that that's why we've done so well. And in the theme of this podcast is proud to work in cannabis, which is something so unique to the cannabis industry. And listening to you talk after doing this for 13 years, the mission behind what you're doing, I have to imagine is what's getting you up every single day, right? And so when you look forward to the next 13 years, hopefully when we run into each other 13 years from now, you have remembered my name. But seriously, 13 years from now, what is the impact that two-part question that you hope to make? And then the second part is anybody getting into this industry right now, what would be the advice to remain mission-driven and grounded? Because at the end of the day, that's how great organizations and great industries are built, right? A job is only a job and you only can stay motivated by that for so long. But every great company that goes on to achieving great things, that the team rallies around a mission. You guys have remained so mission driven and have been so successful. Can you share with the audience how they can remain mission driven and, and grounded? I think that that's 
exactly it, right? You got to believe in something. I'm sure my investors would like to say 13 years from now, they hope that we're making money. That would be something that I'm sure that they would like to see happen. And, and that's kind of the myth of cannabis, right? Because as long as we have the 280E tax penalties, the idea of actually making real money in cannabis is, is pretty much non-existent. Yes, cannabis businesses bring in a lot of money, but what people don't understand is cannabis businesses don't keep that money because we have no write-offs and the way that we're taxed is the same way that Pablo Escobar would be taxed. So I'm hoping that long before 13 years, we end the prohibition on cannabis so that we can perform like regular businesses, have bank accounts, be able to get loans to increase productivity levels, our, our yields and our growth facilities, and those different things that we can do in regular business. That would be my biggest dream for the business of cannabis. However, when you start to talk about the business of cannabis, then you get back to, well, what makes your company unique? It can't just be about making money. And once again, I believe that we keep speaking about the things that matter, which is how do we end the school to prison pipeline? How do we end the addiction to opioids and alcohol? How do we start to make America a safer place to be? And quite frankly, getting back to the, the healing of, of the planet with cannabis and with hemp, right? Hemp is the one plant that puts nutrients back into the soil and does positive things. So there's so much from cannabis that we're about to learn, but that learning curve won't happen until we end the prohibition. I am hopeful that in the next one, two, three years that we are over that hump so that we can start discussing this whole industry in a very different light. If I'm listening to this podcast and I'm in the industry today, what can I do to get behind the cause to end the prohibition of cannabis? Let's assume that maybe I'm an employee at a company that doesn't have some kind of initiative. What it, it, can I do as an individual? I get asked that a lot. And it's so simple. You've got to call your elected officials. Honestly, it starts right there. I don't care if you're a, a bud tender, a trimmer, even if you are a consumer that just would rather come home tonight and smoke a joint with your husband or wife instead of have a martini. We need you involved in this process. Get to know who your city council member is and even a brief conversation. Hey, Mr. City Council, I'm a 50-year-old woman and I like weed. They need to hear that because what happens is the naysayers who are the minority in all of this in America, just real quick, 70% of America wants full-on legalization. 70% of Americans don't agree on anything right now except for ending prohibition. So if we could simply just let our elected officials know from the majority of people who appreciate this plant, who want to see prohibition done, who don't want to see people arrested, who want to be able to study this for medicinal reasons, such as childhood epilepsy and helping with cancer, you have got to call your elected officials, your city council people, your congressmen, your senators, write a letter, send an email. We're serious about what we bring because once again, we are America's most political dispensary. And just another shameless plug, I'm actually running for the University of Colorado Regent, which has control over the University of Colorado system, which includes our medical center and the research opportunities that we would have with cannabis. And I really want to see cannabis be front and center from an educational standpoint and a research standpoint for medicinal purposes moving forward. So please just get involved in this. And like I said, social media is a great way to let the elected officials know what you feel. Well, you have my vote and Vank's donation, so we'll figure out a way that we can allow our listeners to follow the campaign yes. as well. And the last question that we ask every guest in a minute or less, why, Wanda James, are you proud to work in cannabis? Oh, my goodness. It was really funny. I did an interview with a young college student one time, and she had asked me, she says, oh, man, she goes, when you were in college, was this your dream in life to be able to do this? And, and I says, man, when I was in college, this was called drug dealing. So <laughs> it wasn't a career or an opportunity when I was that young. But what I am so proud about is the, the development of this industry. And Carson, it's young women like yourself. My goodness, you came out of college, couldn't find what you wanted, and you created your path. And this is what cannabis is doing for young people everywhere. I mean, in the last 13 years, we've seen things gone from just smoking a joint to vapes and, and papa drops from 1906 and patches and chocolate bars and gummies and all these amazing things that we now have with cannabis. My 
86-year-old mom uses edibles to help her sleep at night. She uses topicals to help the arthritis in her hands. My 22-year-old nephew prefers cannabis over alcohol. So when I think about the pride that we have been able to usher into America and worldwide of people being healthier in their choices and not having things in their system that destroys their kidneys and, and makes them addicted, I just could not be more proud of what we do every day and proud to tell people about what I do. So no, when I was in college, I didn't have the opportunity to do this, but I am a proud dispensary owner, a proud cannabis user, and I am proud to see all of the young people blowing the doors off of what this industry and this business means. Well, if that doesn't get you fired up and motivated, I'm not sure what will. Wanda, you are an absolute legend. Thank you so much for all you do for the cannabis industry, for women in the cannabis industry, for everybody in the entire cannabis industry. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being our first guest on the Proud to Work in Cannabis podcast. And we cannot wait to continue following you and your incredible journey. So thank you, Wanda. Carson, I am so proud of you. And I'm glad that you are doing this. Your voice for this next generation is going to be incredible. And trust me when I say nobody will ever forget your name again (laughs) when you walk into a room. We'll see. We'll see. Thank you, Wanda. (laughs) Thanks, Carson. (laughs) 